Today is Gun Violence Awareness Day, and it's an issue that's impacting thousands of lives across America. The CDC has tracked a consistent rise in the number of firearm-related deaths. It's also now the leading cause of death in children and teens. In 2022, more than 44,000 people died from gun violence, including mass shootings, homicides, and suicides. If you compare that to other types of fatalities in the same year, including the 42,000 people killed in motor vehicle traffic crashes, it is still less than the number of people who lost their lives to gun violence. Here with more on this is Cameron McWhorter. He's the co-author of the upcoming book, American Gun, The True Story of the AR-15, and a reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Um, really good to have you here. Um, I, I want to start with what it is about the AR-15. You know, one of the things that some of these mass shooters have said about why they chose the gun is because it's efficient, it's deadlier, it kills more people. What about this weapon makes it so efficient? That's a that's an excellent point. Uh, it was created in the 1950s as a weapon for uh, the Cold War to fight mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia and other places, and it was made to be really light, shoot really well, uh, and shoot rapidly. And that is was perfect for that kind of fighting and in that kind of war you could carry a lot of ammunition it was very uh well designed but that also makes it really easy for uh very disturbed people to use it today and uh even if they have very very little training in the gun so for example the man in uvalde or the boy in uvalde uh the young teen uh who went in and, and shot up that school had never fired a gun that day uh before that day mm. and so it's very easy to shoot. It has, it's people talk about it being this powerful weapon. It's incredibly easy to shoot. And that makes uh, that is the problem. So for the gun owners, what's the appeal? Um, it's that. yeah, it's fun to shoot uh, people. Uh, it's it's um, it's also become, as we all know, and that's the reason we wrote the book is it's become this pivotal symbol for America's gun debate. We're all talking about the AR-15. There are a lot of guns in this country, uh, but the AR-15, there's at least 20 million of them now, uh, perhaps as many as 25 million, we just don't really know. And they are um, ubiquitous. So how are we going to, um, how do we wrestle with this issue of they're everywhere, but they are really attracting people who wanna hurt a lot of people really quickly. I guess, I guess, I guess, I should have framed my question uh, yeah. a little bit better because I, I wonder. Um, there are other weapons that are easy to fire, easy to use, uh, and that are handguns, um, and that are just as, effect as effective if the message from gun owners is they want to protect themselves or they want to protect their families. Um, so, so why? A, a, a rifle that you typically see, at least the silhouette of it, uh, one that you see militaries carrying. Yeah, but I think that, you know, that part of the issue, though, a lot of people ha buy AR-15s that are not planning on being mass shooters. Uh, part of the issue is that mass shooters tend to choose this weapon because exactly. it's a, you yeah. know, the recoil is, though it's powerful, it doesn't have a strong recoil. There's a lot of damage. A lot of bullets go flying, uh, uh, you know, in a short period of time. And so it is the choice of the mass shooter. But to your question, it, why is it the choice of not the mass shooter? What, what yeah. is there more to, I guess I'm trying to sort of get what the overall narrative has been about this gun that makes it so appealing to people who say they want to protect their home. Um, th these are great questions, Vlad and Amory, great. Uh, the issue is complicated. Uh, it's had a lot to do with marketing, uh, with the marketing of the gun as being this uh, macho. There was a whole campaign uh, years ago about get your man card, buy this gun. It has uh, been, it's relatively inexpensive. It is, again, easy and fun to shoot. If you take it to a gun range and you shoot it, you can feel like you're a great uh, like you're you're really on target and you're an expert marksman, even though you really aren't. Uh, mm. So it has a great appeal. Also, it's become a political symbol. It's a symbol. If you own an AR-15, you are saying to everyone around you, if you put that sticker of an AR, a silhouette of an AR-15 on your car, you're telling everyone around you, I support the Second Amendment. And that is uh, that is the political battle. And if you go to gun control rallies, 
they have uh, people will be carrying signs with a, a line through that that weapon. And it is um, so it has become the center of our gun debate. You know, and so it also has, sorry, I was going to say on. what's so interesting is that when I was a child in the 70s, um, uh, we knew that there were some people who had guns, but we also knew that they were for hunting or for protection. Mm -hmm. Right. Much in the same way as Canadians uh, mm -hmm. keep weapons. Mm -hmm. Um, what happened with the evolution of the National Rifle Association that caused this, this blossoming of gun culture, as you say, where you use marketing materials that suggest having an AR-15 style uh, rifle is a man card? I mean, because the NRA, as far as, as, far as I understand it, was not as powerful as it is today um, during the, even the Reagan years. Um, well, I wouldn't look to the NRA. I would look to the gun companies. Uh, and I would say uh, it's a very complicated story, which we just wrote a book about. Right. <laughs> but the, uh, it, involves, uh, it involves the guns, this type of weapon, the, the platform that created the AR-15 going out of copyright so that smaller companies could, could develop uh, the gun pretty cheaply. It's a really cheap, easy gun to make. The markup, uh, the profits that they could make were, were extraordinary. And the marketing really worked. And there were um, political reasons that that sort of pushed that, including the assault weapons ban right. uh, uh, in the 1990s. All these things propelled this gun into a, a if you were a gun owner uh, today, you know, in the 2000s, beginning in the 2000s, you wanted to own this gun. Mm. And it was relatively easy to do. Uh, the problem, of course, we're, we're, we're talking about, uh, the reason we're talking about this is mass shootings. Right. Because so, it's you started to draw people who want to hurt a lot of people really quickly. So Cameron, a couple of times you sort of brought up the politics of the whole thing, and it seems like ancient history when there was an assault weapons ban, um, uh, it expired, and that is just so people know that, so that's why we're where we are at today. But since then, too, Certainly, it feels like we have become much more divided as a country politically, that a lot of these issues, these culture war issues, have taken on much greater meaning. It's not about just, you know, you, you want to own a gun to protect your, your home. It's about now, are, are you protecting the Constitution? Are you an American? It's so much heavier. Um, is something like, you know... Uh, an assault weapons ban, it, are we so far gone now that we can't even really bring that up as a conversation? Because often when we talk about gun legislation, it's about, you know, red flag laws and stuff like that. But out and out banning these deadly weapons doesn't seem to come up anymore. Um, well, some politicians still talk about it quite a lot, including the president. Uh, I think the practical reality is that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Again, you, as you guys just mentioned, 20 more than 20 million of these guns are in civilian hands right now. Uh, that is an extraordinary amount. Before the assault weapons ban went into effect in 1994, there were approximately 400,000 in this country. So we've seen an explosion in, in ownership of these guns. So how would you possibly round them up? I think you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, and I heard earlier, you guys were talking about the, the, uh, the debt ceiling deal. We're not very good at compromise in this country, but we really, particularly, I think everybody agrees we want less mass shootings. And we want those mass shootings, if they unfortunately take place, to be less deadly. So what do we do? What policies do we pass to try to do that? And I think that's where the focus has to be and regarding the AR-15. Uh, and that's what politicians need to start focusing on. It's a good question. Because nobody wants more of this stuff. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Uh, Cameron McWhorter, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it. Great talking to you.